I'm Dr. Frank Ciminello. I serve as the Section Chief of Craniofacial Surgery and Pediatric Plastic Surgery at the Hackensack Medical Center. My practice focuses primarily on children and specifically children with facial uh, deformities, either acquired or congenital. Most of what I see in my practice are children that come in with head deformation issues. The parents bring them in because the head looks a little strange to them and they're looking for opinions either medical or surgical. With regards to head deformation, the condition is known as plagiocephaly. And plagiocephaly means simply a twisting of the head. The reasons why kids get plagiocephaly can be something as simple as the way they're lying in bed or something as um, concerning as the head is abnormal because of something going on with the skull or brain. With regards to plagiocephaly that is a result of deformation, what happened back in 1991 and 92, there was uh, something called SIDS, the Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And what happened in SIDS is children were dying of unknown reasons uh, shortly after birth. And what they concluded is these children were suffocating. The parents were putting the child on their, on their face or on their belly, and the children were tragically dying from that because they were unable to roll back over. So in 1991 and 92, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out the Back to Sleep campaign. And what the Back to Sleep campaign did is said that you have to put the child on their back until they're able to roll over on their own. Um, and what happened with that is the incidence of SIDS came down like this, but the incidence of head deformation went up like this. And the reason for that is that as the children are lying on their back, they don't have a lot of head control. And if they're lying on the back and they're lying on this side, for instance, um, the head will then shift. And to that end, what's important to understand is that when the children are first born, uh, they're born with a series of bones. It's not one fused skull like it is in you and I. What there are is there's two bones in the front, the left and right frontal bone. There's two bones on the side, the left and right temporal parietal bone, and one bone in the back called the lambdoid bone. And there's several small bones on the side. Between each of these bones are something called the cranial sutures. And the cranial sutures, specifically in this model, um, hold the bones together. They're fibrous structures and they're the growth centers of the skull. There's one that goes from here to here called the mitopic suture. There's one that goes from here to here called the left and right coronal suture, the sagittal suture, and the left and right lambdoid suture. And where two or more sutures come together, it's called a fontanelle, which in common term would be called the soft spot. So there's a soft spot in the front, and there's a soft spot in the back. Um, these are the growth centers of the skull, and what's important to know about this is that the infant brain is doubling in volume in the first two years of life. So there's massive growth of the brain in those first two years. And because the skull is not a fused nut, it's able to expand. And specific to that back to sleep campaign, if the child is laying on the back of the head, like say for instance on the left hand side here, because it's not fused and they're laying on that a little too much, everything starts to shift. So when they come in, in something called deformational positional plagiocephaly, they're laying over here and everything is shifting forward. So they'll get a flat spot on the one side, the ear will shift forward and the forehead gets a little full. And you get what's called a parallelogram type of, of deformity where the head will be full here, flat here, and everything is shifting on the ipsilateral side. Alternatively, they're laying flat on the back of their head and the head gets very flat in the back and gets very tall on the top. And that's called brachycephaly. So positional plagiocephaly, specifically deformational plagiocephaly that's related to position, is treated one of three ways. It's treated by nothing, as these kids will likely self-improve in most cases. It's treated by some physical therapy, because in 80 to 90 percent of kids with positional plagiocephaly, they have an imbalance in the neck muscles. They're either a little stiff or a little weak in the neck muscles. And because they can't control the neck, the head deforms, and then once they get a flat spot, they'll continue to roll to that. So with some physical therapy that happens early, around two months of age, up to six months of age, if we can strengthen the head muscles and offload the pressure, the head will round out on its own. The last thing that you can do is what you see around, like those helmets. You know, the kids with the teddy bears on the heads and so on and so forth. And the idea of the helmet therapy, it'll block where the head is a little full. So in this case, let's go back to the scenario where the head is flat on the left and full on the left front. It'll block here, it doesn't push, it blocks and it'll leave some space in the back where the head is flat. And if we remember that the brain is doubling in volume in those first two years of life, as the brain grows, it's going to push the skull back where it's a little flat and the head will round out. All right, and you wear that for a couple months, 23 hours a day, and it's very effective. But specific to that, it's important to know what the indications are for helmet therapy. About three, four years ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out an article they classified the different severities of positional plagiocephaly, and they then said, what are the indications for helmet therapy as opposed to PT or nothing at all? Um, the conclusions of that paper said that for kids with mild to moderate positional plagiocephaly, 
so kids that aren't too bad within one or two standard deviations of normal um, and they are self-improving so just with positioning and some physical therapy that if you took two kids one with a helmet one without a helmet and you looked at them at 10 years they both were improving and had moderate positional plagiocephaly there was no long-term benefit to a helmet so there's no indication for it right in the long term there's probably a short-term benefit but probably not a long-term benefit if you took a kid with moderate positional plagiocephaly that was not improving or a kid with severe position plagiocephaly, two standard deviations outside of normal, then those kids probably would benefit from a helmet therapy at 10 years. So I think helmets are, are good when they're used appropriately and when the criteria is justified. Uh, but all kids are different. Surgical head deformation is a completely separate topic. And in this case, what we're gonna talk about is craniosynostosis. There's the two in the front, two on the side, and the one in the back, and the cranial sutures. The cranial sutures close at different times. The one in the front closes somewhere between six and nine months of age. The ones on the, so on the top and on the side close multiple years later. Um, if these sutures were to fuse prematurely, in other words, these fibrous structures turn to bone, either in utero or shortly after birth, what happens is the head takes on a very predictable and abnormal head shape. If the mitopic suture closes, this again is the growth center of the skull. And in this case, what you see is growth occurs perpendicular to these sutures. So if this is the mitopic suture, it goes from the nose to the soft spot, and growth is occurring to the left and to the right, and this suture fuses prematurely. What happens is there's growth arrest here, and the head will become increasingly more triangular. And this is known as trigonocephaly. So the head takes on a, a baseball diamond-like shape, where there's no growth here, and there's compensatory growth in the back because the brain is still growing despite the fact that the skull is not expanding here. And that's called trigonocephaly, mitopic synostosis. If the coronal suture fuses, that's the left and right coronal suture, either one can fuse or both can fuse. And again, the growth occurs here, perpendicular to these sutures. So what happens if this suture fuses or this suture fuses, there's no growth in this direction and the skull becomes extremely tall. And this is called turicephaly or tower skull deformity. If it fuses on the one side, what you'll see is a flattening and the skull will pull up on this side. If it happens on both sides, there's flattening across the brow and the skull then pulls up. In addition, what you'll see with regards to the eye is that the eye will likewise be pulled up towards the affected suture. And this is called the harlequin eye deformity. So the eye will be pulled up and back on one side if it's on a left unicoronal synostosis or a right unicoronal synostosis. And with bicoronal synostosis, both eyes are pulled up laterally, the brow is pulled back, and then the skull becomes very tall. With regards to the sagittal suture, and the sagittal suture extends from the coronal sutures all the way back to the lambert suture. So from the soft spot in the front to the soft spot in the back. And if growth is occurring perpendicular to this suture, if this suture fuses and there's growth arrest, the skull becomes very long. And this is called scaphocephaly, like a boat. So the, the head will be very full in the front, it'll be very full in the back, and narrow in this direction. Lamboid synostosis is fusion of the left and right lamboid suture. And what you see in this case is that there's growth arrest either here or here. And if you remember before, we were talking about kids with positional plagiocephaly as relates, relates to pressure, deformation. Um, and it's easy to confuse lamboid fusion with just simple positional plagiocephaly because again if we have a flat spot on the one side and the head's a little full on the front on the same side and the ear shifts forward this is related to pressure where the, everything is shifting if there's growth or rest you're going to get the same flat spot over here but the ear is going to pull back towards the affected suture because there's growth everywhere else and there's no growth here so what happens typically with lamboid synostosis which is the most rare form of cranial synostosis it's sometimes difficult to determine if it's fusion of the lamboid suture, or if this is something as simple as just positional plagiocephaly, which can be treated with physical therapy or helmet. But the, the, the telltale point of a, a lamboid synostosis is on the side where it's flat, the ear is pulled towards the flat spot, as opposed to positional plagiocephaly as relates to pressure, where the ear is pushed away. As far as surgical treatment of cranial synostosis, um, it's varied. Not all kids with cranial synostosis require surgery. Sometimes if the fusion happens late in gestation or shortly after birth, the degree of deformation isn't terrible, and you can just watch these. And we'll talk about what the functional implications are of cranial synostosis in a second. If the condition becomes surgical, 
Um, there's two mainstays with regards to reconstruction of the cranial vault. If the child is seen prior to four months of age, closer to two months of age, and we diagnose cranial stenostosis, premature fusion of the cranial sutures, there's a technique now called endoscopic stenostectomy. And with that technique, small incisions are made. So let's say, for instance, the mitopic suture is fused. A small incision is made back in the hairline, about two centimeters, and with a special instrument and with a special scope, we can surgically remove the suture. So the sticky spot now is removed. Um, there's very little blood loss. It, the hospital stay is only about a day. And as the brain now continues to grow, and with the use of those custom cranial orthotics, those helmets, the head will now normalize over time. So the brain is growing, the sticky spot is removed, and everything normalizes. And you can do that for mitopic synostosis, sagittal synostosis, as well as coronal synostosis. The problem that I found in my practice, as this technique has kind of been around now for a few years, is that with coronal synostosis, again, you have to remember that it's the forehead and the eyes. With this type of surgical correction, the forehead does improve, but the eyes don't always improve as much as we might like them to. So then the second type of surgery that we can offer you is what's called traditional cranial vault remodeling, CBR. And with CBR, it's been the mainstay of craniofacial reconstruction for craniofacial craniosynostosis for 30, 40, 50 years. And with that type of surgery, um, it's a larger incision. It's an incision that goes from ear to ear. We expose all the abnormal bones. And if we're talking about mitopic synostosis, where again, the eyes are narrow on the side, the forehead is very triangular, we can remove all the abnormal structures and reconstruct all the bones to normalcy in one step. There is more blood loss in the surgery. The hospital stay is longer. Uh, but this is a time-tested technique. Um, so the options are varied. It really depends on presentation. With traditional cranial vault remodeling, that tip that's typically done between six and nine months of age. The endoscopic technique is typically done much, much earlier, around two months of age. Um, they're both very useful. I think it depends on the severity of the condition. Um, it depends on the timing of presentation. It depends on which suture is involved. But both techniques are very effective.